Hello, booktube. Well, it's stressful and depressing days here in the, in, the, in the present day, looking at the present day news. I'm sure you know that. I'm taking the liberty of talking to you in these videos just because it cheers me up to talk to you. I'm hoping that you're enjoying it at, at least a little, maybe a little distraction in the course of your day. Uh, and one of the ways that I like to think about the present is to forget it and think about the future. So I've been looking at my at books coming up down the line, books that I'm not reading yet. I have six books here that I want to show you. I'm not sure how many of them have shown up on this channel, uh, but they are a way for us to think for a minute about months and months and months down the line when maybe the world situation will be better. Maybe it will be. Experts, epidemiologists tend to say that it will be much worse, but you never know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's human nature to think the, of the future with optimism. Uh, so I want to show you uh, these six books and we'll see if we can escape into them. The first one, the escaping, is going to be pretty hard because this first one comes out in May and it is the single greatest work of accidental prescience, of, of great timing, that I've seen in the publishing world and I don't know how long. This is by uh, Lawrence Wright, the nonfiction writer who wrote The Looming Tower. Um, that you, Some of you may have read. It's a fantastic book. You should read it. He also writes fiction. <laughs> and his new novel uh, in May is called The End of October. And it's going to make, if you, I, those of you who have been looking at the news won't need any help identifying what that thing is on the cover. It's not a star. Let's give it that. It's not the sun. But wait do you read it? <laughs> this is just unbelievable to me. At an internment camp in Indonesia, 47 people are pronounced dead of acute hemorrhagic fever. When microbiologist Dr. Henry Parsons travels there on behalf of the World Health Organization to investigate, he finds he will soon have staggering repercussions. His driver, unknowingly car carrying the devastating infectious disease, has joined the millions of worshippers at the annual Hajj to Mecca. Meanwhile, halfway across the globe, the deputy director of U.S. Homeland Security scrambles to mount a response to the rapidly spreading pandemic, which she believes may be the result of an act of bio-warfare. Already fraying global relations begin to snap one by one as the virus slashes across the United States, dismantling institutions, scientific, religious, governmental, and decimating the population. A full-tilt, electrifying, one-of-a-kind thriller steeped in real-life political and scientific implications, this is the most gripping read of the year. Lawrence Wright probably finished writing this a year ago. Final galleys, final artwork, final everything was probably done half a year ago more even. No one connected with this could possibly have guessed that this would that this would get to bookstores in the middle of a worldwide pandemic. So, I have to wonder, is Knopf, is Knopf going to pull this? Are they going to delay it out of bad taste? Or are they going to do what they should do and publish it and hope that it becomes a mega bestseller? <laughs> it, 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 those serendipities like this, weird uh, strokes of timing like this, are nobody's fault at all. And they're not evil. It's obviously not opportunism. Lawrence Wright was writing this a long time ago. And he's a well-respected author. Well-respected and, and the real deal. He's the real deal as an author. He's a nice guy. An upstanding guy. A mensch. In other words, it would never occur to him to write this novel now. If had he, had he, this is certainly not an act of opportunism on his part. I don't know if it's any good, but boy oh boy, if it comes out in May, it's going to go to the number one bestseller list in no time at all, I would think. Uh, then this next one, well, <laughs> we're having a little bit of a rocky start getting away from the present day. Uh, but this is also, this is coming out in May. This is by Sarah Posner, and it is Unholy. Why Evangelicals Worship at the Altar of Donald Trump. Uh, and the book is exactly about that. It's about the Evangelical Christian right, which we have seen uh, coming in for a number of exposés in recent mail halls. Uh, to many, Trump's appeal to the religious right seems incongruous. How did a serial adulterer with no history of upholding conservative Christian values manage to successfully engage the support of a bloc that professes to be united by moral principles? And this book is a combination of more than a decade of on-the-ground reporting and deep historical examination and seeks to answer that question. I think the answer to that question is not a book, but a single sentence, to seize the Supreme Court. But, you know, if you're an author of a book, you want your book to go on a little longer than that, so we shall see. We shall see what the author delves into. Uh, this next one is a work of history. Uh, this comes out in also in May, uh, and it is by a great historian, someone that, that uh, I mention on this channel all the time, that authors build up a, a bank account of goodwill, and this author couldn't have a better bank account with me. I'm sure that this book would be brilliant. Uh, this is by Harold Holzer, uh, a great writer on Lincoln, uh, and it is uh, The Presidents versus the Press. 
Uh, and it, the subtitle is The Endless Battle Between the White House and the Media from the Founding Fathers to Fake News. And some of you remember uh, that um, Harold Holzer wrote a book on this subject. I wonder if it's mentioned here. It probably is. No. Well, now, why would that be? He wrote a book um, on this subject. Uh, hang on here. Lincoln and the Power of the Press. A few years ago, about a decade ago, maybe a little longer than that, that really caught on. Uh, critics thought it was fascinating about what the measures that Lincoln took to limit and destroy the free press during the Civil War. Uh, and this is an, ex an expansion. This is the whole of that subject, the whole of the American presidency and its relation with the free press. Um, uh, Seldom has our free press faced so great a threat as today with the President of the United States calling the free press the enemy of the American people. Uh, and yet the tension between presidents and journalists is as old as the Republic itself. George Washington, upon seeing an unflattering character of himself in a local newspaper, got into one of those passions when he cannot command himself, according to Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson. Every president since has been tested by the American media. And that's what this is. This is a dream come true, if you, if you like American history, because Harold Holzer, it doesn't, he doesn't, it doesn't get much better done than the way he does it. And here he's just going president by president. That is great. Well, that is something to look forward to. Really is. Uh, and then this next one is a technological thriller. Uh, this comes out also in May. Uh, and this is um, by two authors, P.W. Singer and August Cole. And it's called Burn In. Uh, a novel of the real robotic revolution. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the pub sheet is a little coy about what that real revolution will be. Uh, but I think I know. I think you'll be able to know, too. America is on the brink of revolution. AI and robotics have realized science fiction's dreams, but have also taken millions of jobs and made many citizens fear the future uh, that has left them behind. After narrowly averting a bombing at Washington's Union Station, FBI Special Agent Laura Keegan receives a new assignment to field test the first police robot. In the wake of a series of shocking catastrophes, the two find themselves investigating a conspiracy, the two being her and the robot find themselves investigating a conspiracy whose mastermind is using cutting-edge tech to rip the nation apart. To stop this new breed of terrorists, Keegan's only hope is to forge a new kind of partnership. I have a feeling that I can sense all kinds of things that are going to happen in this book, and they are intriguing, to put it, to put it mildly. Uh, so this is uh, comes out in late May. It's Burn In. I think it's going to be uh, very, very thought-provoking. We'll see if it's done well. Uh, but uh, and then we've got two two big things to finish this out here. One, they're both fantasy, so they're a way to escape, <laughs> at least a bit. They're a way to escape. Uh, this first one is uh, by Nick Martell. It's a great big thing. It comes out in May or in early May, and it is his debut. It's The Kingdom of Liars. Uh, let's see here. In this brilliant debut fantasy, a story of secrets, rebellion, and murder are shattering the hollows of the capital H. Where magic costs memory to use, people can do magic, but they have to they have to sacrifice memory to do it. That's the fuel here. And the only son of the kingdom's despised traitor holds the truth. Michael is branded a traitor. As a child, he became the murderer. He, as a, okay, as, okay, all right, okay, all right, and scene. <laughs> okay, Michael is branded a traitor as a child because of the murder of the king's nine-year-old son by his father, David Kingman. I don't know who the king is in that sentence. I don't know who the son is in that sentence. I don't know who the murderer in that sentence is. I don't know who Michael is related to in that sentence. I have no idea. No idea at all. But I do know now, in this kind of odd Chomsky and linguistic way, what a sentence would read like if its author had no idea that dependent clauses even existed. Let's move on. <laughs> Ten years later on, Michael knows something is there in the hot white emptiness of his mind that can clear his family name. In a world where memory is the coin that pays for magic, the Hollows is ruled by a royal family that is spiraling into a self-serving dictatorship just as gun-wielding rebels clash against the country's magically trained militia. Uh, okay, well, so... so uh, Translating that <laughs> just a bit. So this character, Michael Kingman, has a feeling that one of the memories that is gone from his own mind holds a key to his kingdom's future. And that is, that is fascinating. It's a huge thing. So obviously it'll be a cast of thousands. Uh, but it's intriguing to me, that whether it's uh, the magic of, Ray, of Recluse or Michael Farland's books. Where, whenever you have a magic system in a fantasy where the magic has a cost, a discrete, noticeable cost, 
That's always fascinating. Uh, and then this next one, this next one is not May, it's July, and it's, think, I think it's going to be on the, uh, on the must-buy list for a lot of you. <laughs> it certainly, uh, certainly should be, because the, the previous volume here was, uh, I was skeptical about it, I was very pleased. Uh, I don't have, uh, well, I do, I do have a cover to show you. This is by, uh, edited by Ann and Jeff Vandermeer. Uh, it's a Vintage Books original, it's going to be a huge trade paperback, so you can already guess what it's going to be. This is a big book of modern fantasy. They did a uh, big book of classic fantasy. Uh, I don't know if it's mentioned here. No. Uh, well, they did. <laughs> they did. I, let me see if I can, if I can find the translate, the, the, uh, the mention for it here. Uh, yeah, the big book of classic fantasy. That came out, I think, last year, or a little bit, a little bit earlier than that. And this is The Natural Companion coming out in July. This is a gigantic thing that is more modern fantasy. Uh, return to the sumptuous global feast of fantasy fiction with Anne and Jeff's selection of modern masterpieces from the swinging 60s to the strange 70s to the over-the-top 80s to the gnarly 90s. <laughs> then beyond and into the 21st century, uh, the Vandermeers have found the stories and writers from around the world that invented... Okay, who invented? Okay, writers are people. It's writers who. It's people who, not writers who, not writers that. Uh, that uh, who invented and revitalized the fantasy genre after World War II. Uh, and I know this is, these are uh, big, opulent things. They're double printed, the double column. And I know you're going to want to know some of the people in here. Uh, we won't be able to go through them all because this, this is... Uh, <clears throat> let's see here. So, among... Uh, Mainstream fiction writers who dabbled in fantasy and who are included here. We have Paul Bowles, Nabokov, Borges, um, Marquez, uh, Amos Tutuola, uh, Julio Cortazar. Who else do we have here that is not a fantasy writer that, are, that just happened to write fantasy? Uh, probably there are quite a few. Uh, uh, let's see, do we have anybody else? Oh no, these are mostly fantasy people. Oh, that's good. Uh, Calvino, Bukakov. Okay, all right. Well, but let's see. Let's see who we have for fantasy stalwarts, because that's that's what you're, most of you're going to be interested. We have Jack Vance, uh, Leanne the Wayfarer. Uh, we have a um, Manly Wade Wellman. Oh, ugly bird! I can't believe Manly Wade Wellman still gets published, still gets reprinted. That's fantastic. And if he's in here, going hard, God knows who there's hope for. Um, Fritz Leiber is in here. Lean Times and Lankmar. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, the Dreaming City by Michael Moorcock. Great. Uh, great. R.A. Lafferty is in here. Narrow Valley. That's a bit of a surprise. Joanna Ross is in here. The Barbarian. Not I wouldn't have picked The Barbarian, but that's great. Uh, the Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas by Ursula K. Le Guin. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, we have Angela Carter in here. The Earl King. Samuel Delaney. Tales of Dragons and Dreamers. Greg Bear. The White Horse Child. C.J. Chera. The Dreamstone. Uh, George R. R. Martin, The Ice Dragon. Oh boy, I haven't read The Ice Dragon since I read it in an anthology about dragon stuff probably 40 years ago. That I think was just called Dragons. Uh, Jane Yolen is in here, Sister Light, Sister Dark. What a great choice. Uh, the Luck in the Head by M. John Harrison. Great. Fantastic. Stephen King is in here and so is his son. Stephen King's story is Mrs. Todd's Shortcut. Joe Hill's story is Pop Art. Uh, neither one of them should be in here, but uh, certainly the son shouldn't be. But I guess it's not, this is not, a, this is the big book of modern fantasy. This is not claiming to be a definitive canon. So I guess there's, there's room for maneuvering here. Uh, David Drake is in here. The Fool by David Drake. Good Lord. I wonder how many people will be introduced to David Drake by this book. Uh, looks like Angela Carter's here twice. Because we also have Alice in Prague or The Curious Room. Angela Carter deserves to be in here at least a couple of times. That's great. Terry Pratchett is in here. Uh, but also Patricia McKillop. That's great. Um... Anybody else here that I would know? I mean, I'll go through this. I'll go through this uh, with loving care and attention. Garth Nix is in here. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. So it looks like the stories move forward in time because the last page of the table of contents, Garth Nix is the only name I recognize. I don't know any of the others. Uh, but one way or another, this is going to be, that's going to be a feast for you right there, the big book of modern fantasy. So that's, a, that's something for you to keep your, to keep your spirits up, to keep your mind on for July. <laughs> that's a long way off, but we'll make it through <laughs> and there'll be books. Uh, so we have uh, the big book of modern fantasy. We have the Kingdom of Liars, Nick Martell's uh, fantasy debut, big ambitious book. We have Burn In, in which a, a federal agent has to make an alliance with non-humans. Uh, we have The Presidents and the Press 
by Harold Hoser. Harold Hoser is a name, if you're not familiar with it, you should look for it at your library. I mean, you can wait for this book in May, but everything he wrote is really good. Uh, maybe not so much the books that he co-authored. If he's co-authored something, you might want to check it out, sit down and read a bit of it. But if he wrote it himself, alone, oh, so good. His books on Lincoln are so good. Uh, then Unholy, a book about the, uh, the radical religious rights alliance with Donald Trump. Uh, and finally, uh, the serendipity feat of the year, the end of October by Lawrence Wright, about a worldwide pandemic that's coming out in May in the middle of a worldwide pandemic. <laughs> you just can't predict that sort of stuff. You can't make it up. And no one can make a, an advertising campaign that's anywhere near as good. So, so we shall see. I'm wondering what will happen. I'm wondering if Knopf will pull it. Uh, if they'll consider it tasteless, if if maybe they'll be accused of stuff. I mean, we we know here we're it, dyed wool dyed in the wool readers, right? So we know that these things can't be turned around on a dime unless they're self-published. Something from Knopf has been in the works for a long time. It's not like this is opportunism, but most of the reading public are not dyed in the wool readers, as as uh, as uh, counterintuitive as that seems, and it, they might raise the hue and cry of opportunism. If this book shows up, I have no idea. If I were in the marketing department at Knopf, I wouldn't hesitate for a minute. But I don't know if they will or not. It's more timid times. Uh, and who knows, who knows, by late May, if it'll mean anything. Will bookstores even be open in late May? Who knows? Uh, but one way or another, <laughs> one way or another, these are all firmly lodged in the future. And I'm hoping that thinking about the future makes you feel a little bit better. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.